<laughs> wow. I don't think it gets much better than that. I just wish those blooms lasted a little bit longer. Let's start out the day by prospecting for plants. We have a couple gardens that are pretty barren, like the one I just weeded on the slope. And we really could use a little help besides the seeds. And what better place to find it than in this absolutely exuberant potager, which is just tumbling over already with plants. And you can see right here in between the flagstones where I have already done a little prospecting. Because even though I said I was going to leave those primroses in the path, oh, I changed my mind because I couldn't get through. And you can see why. They are just taking over the entire path. But it's such a beautiful little plant, I'm going to dig it up and I'm going to put it all around the gardens. I put a little bit of effort into it, but not much. I've had to move the stones, lifted the stones up, and dug out the plants. They've got some pretty good roots on them. And I will be able to transplant those into several different gardens. around in this potager. I'm going to see all sorts of things that I could take if I wanted to. Just look at the black-eyed Susans growing between the flagstones, St. John's wort. Now if I wanted any lambs here, I could really thin out this lambs here in this garden right here. This is something I always have an abundance of growing in the walkways are daisies. This is sedum. Just grows like crazy. And all you have to do is pull it up like that. You don't even have to get it by the roots and just toss it in any garden if you want a ground cover. This is a great little sedum. Try to be. Wow. Did I mention that it is a beautiful day today? It's also Good Friday. Two things to be very grateful to God for. You can fill in a sparse or a new garden is by just looking in your other gardens and finding plants that are doing pretty well and they're pretty prolific and maybe moving a few of them to a space that isn't so fortunate. It's just like moving the furniture in your house. So many plants are easily moved, especially perennials. They take kindly to being moved especially if they're, if they're in crowded conditions. This is a rose bush that I moved just about two weeks ago. And it's a wild rose bush and I need something to climb up my pergola because I removed half the wisteria, which was going absolutely crazy. And another easy plant to move are coneflowers. These are perennials, these are purple coneflowers. I have a grouping here of at least 10, and I really could use them elsewhere in this garden. So I'm going to thin these out just a little bit because these will be very full plants. Right now they're just starting to come up again. But I would like to take some of these and move them somewhere else in this garden where it's pretty barren. Now right here in this section, you can see I have got one, two, three, four, five, six coneflowers all growing in this little section right here. Um, so I'm going to split those up a little bit by carefully using my root slayer. And I'm going to probably remove about three of these and place these in another garden. So it's really, really pretty straightforward. I think I'll take this one here on the outside to start with. Dig down deep. I want to get as much of the soil that I've got here as possible. So I want to go really deep. There we go. Because I really don't want to disturb it that much. And here I've got not only a wild strawberry. Here I've got a lovely coneflower to remove and put in another garden. Actually, I think there are two plants there. Now I want to take maybe two more of these. Place the soil, and, you know, I think I'm going to give this one too. And I'm not really harming anything. 
and I'm still leaving enough coneflowers here. There we go. Here. There. So here I have one. Whoa. Nice little worm. And I think this one, I'm going to just leave it as a bunch. I could split it right there, but no. So I've got three coneflowers to move to the center of this garden. Now here we have a lonely little coneflower sitting here with a sedum. And so I don't want this coneflower to be alone. I'm going to make this grouping, a grouping of four coneflowers in a nice triangle shape. And I always plant at least three of the same type of plant together. Set your plant in. Just cover the roots a little bit. Give it a nice drink. And then fill in the rest of the soil. Now you might have droopy leaves for about a day or two, but the plant will perk up. Last week in the video I talked about how you didn't need a great deal of space to create a garden, and this is a perfect example. Here is just a little spot right off the backyard courtyard and this little brick courtyard underneath the pergola that really needs some attention. This could use some ever-loving care. So I'm just going to clean this up and then go find a few things that I have salvaged around the property to plant this into a lovely little garden. First I'll clean it up and then I'll see what I can come up with to plant here. look 100% better after you add the compost. But I'm ready to put some plants in here now. So we've got all these free primroses we can put in. I'm going to give them a deep hole and then water them. And I found a bucket of daffodils that I dug up from another spot where they were not necessary. And then I think we will sprinkle some pansy seeds in here as well. So here in this little pocket, we're going to just stuff this full of little primroses. And you can split these apart very easily just by tugging on them a little bit. Very gently and pulling those roots apart. These transplant really well. Of course, they grow well from seed too, but since you've already got the plants, why bother with the seed if you've already got the primroses? In just a few weeks, this will just be filled with beautiful little pink blooms. And they will bloom twice. So after they bloom, cut them all the way down to there. And then we're going to put, um, we're also going to put some pansy seeds in here today. So the pansies will come up after these. And then these will bloom once again later in the summer. So this doesn't have to be anything elaborate. It's just a little pocket garden here. But you can take every little space that you have and make it beautiful. Like I said, you don't need a huge yard or a huge acreage to have a pretty garden. You can do it in a small space too. And if you do have a lot of acreage, well, Take advantage of every little inch that you've got and try to make it lovely. Chicken cultivators. Last week we pulled weeds, but I wanted to show you this slope, which is in the back of the house and on the side of the house. I wanted to show you this slope because this is a no-dig garden. And underneath all that compost is cardboard. We laid the cardboard right on top of the grass and um, it just killed all the grass and the weeds. And then of course the chickens are coming in here and doing their bit. I haven't planted anything in there yet. It's a good thing. I'd be pretty mad at those chickens. But they really do their little part. And um, this is a great way to garden if you don't have existing plants. You just want to kill the grass or the weeds and you don't have to worry about any perennials or trees coming up. So this is a um, wonderful wonderful way to garden and my mentor in this is the wonderful Charles Doubting who has a great channel on YouTube. I'll link him below. This was also a no-dig garden two years ago and then I planted annuals in here. Just seeds. Nothing but seeds. 
and you can see what's happening in here. It's just absolutely fantastic. Now, I'm not going to tell you that the weeds didn't come back because there's plenty of weeds in here, but mostly not. Most of all, we have, as I think I told you about two weeks ago, because I was so excited about the way this garden had reseeded itself. These are poppies. These are Papaver somniferum poppies. And they reseeded into this garden. And these are the wonderful old antique flower, which is the larkspur. This is a transplant daisy that I moved from somewhere else in the yard. And then we have these are bachelor buttons that also reseeded themselves. And all the way up the hill, you see poppies and larkspur just going all the way up the slope. This thing is just full of them. They're almost, um, <laughs> it's almost too packed in here. But uh, one of the things I've been doing for getting free plants is I have been coming in here with my shovel and digging up a lot of these and moving them to other gardens. Poppies don't really like to be transplanted much, but so far they've been fine. And the larkspur has been perfectly fine being transplanted as well. So, you know, if you don't, if you have an abundance of some plant, you might as well just give it a try. What have you got to lose? Well, I hope you have been as busy in your garden as I have been. It's just amazing how quickly things can change and how fast things begin to grow once the weather warms up and the rains pour a few times. I've been having a lot of fun in here. So here we have the Colonial Herb Garden again, which I started way back in January, laying the groundwork and making the plans for this. And things have really changed a lot here. I'm just going to start out with this little lumpy bumpy courtyard here, which is underneath the pergola. Here's the pergola. We trimmed, we cut away half the wisteria. It was just getting to be a little bit too obnoxious. We wanted a little more light in here anyway. But once upon a time, back in January, this was a walkway going straight through here. But we decided to put the pergola to use for the purpose of which it was made, and that's to sit underneath and enjoy the garden. So I removed all the sidewalk and used all the brick to lay this little strip of patio, courtyard, whatever you want to call it. And then I completely dug up this section here to create this good sized herb garden, which is also going to have a lot of vegetables. And I noticed that it's a lot shadier here than I expected it to be. You're going to have to cut a couple trees. But I've also discovered that there are many herbs and many vegetables that actually like the shade. And so I think we're going to have some spinaches in here and also radishes, chard, Swiss chard, things that will tolerate more shady conditions. And then I've got this funny little pea fence that I made yesterday, just with the extra waddle that I had from making my woven garden fence here. And the daffodils did their job, as you can see. They made these wonderful lines for me, crisscrossing the garden, but they're just about spent and it's almost time to cut off the tops so that they don't put all their energy into making seed. So we'll be cutting off the tops of these. And then when this leaves turn yellow, then I'll cut these all the way down to the ground. But here are the tulips and I'm really surprised that <laughs> they're orange because they weren't supposed to be orange tulips. They were supposed to be pink tulips. And instead I've got this, huh, I don't know, tangerine and funny little tulip. I haven't got a clue what, <laughs> what it is, but it's pretty no matter what. And I'm really loving what's going on inside the planter here because I've got the little sweet peas coming up and then I've got this hyacinth, red hyacinth bean, purple hyacinth bean plant. Might overtake the entire trellis, I 
hope it's not too heavy. And then inside you can see the little nasturtiums that were planted from seed coming up as well. Every part of the nasturtium is edible, so I think it's really appropriate for it to be in the herb garden. And then along the lines here where the alliums and the daffodils are, I have planted Swiss chard to create my lines once again. And then to cut this little pie shape right down the middle, I've got some itsy bitsy glow basils coming up in each pie shape. So, although this is still in the planning stages, it's actually looking pretty good. Now you can also see there's the slope that I weeded in the last video and it's looking pretty good but then I also went over and weeded the slope across from it and let me show you that one because it was really bad. This is the side right across from where I did the weeding this was worse. This was full of grass. It took me about three days to do the weeding on this side and it was quite something. But now it's looking pretty good and pretty clean. And I have actually transplanted quite a few things into this garden that came from other gardens, which I will be talking about in a little while. These are Larkspur, Foxglove, and poppies that have come from other gardens. I have seed in many of these places that you see barricaded. This is just temporary. I just have to do this because the chickens will come in here and destroy everything before it's gotten a chance to grow. So I often have to put up barricades in the gardens just to keep the seedlings safe from the chicken folk. And here are a grouping of many, many different kinds of bee balm that I stole from other gardens and brought them into this one. Here in Hopalong Hollow, I like to say that we are perfectly imperfect. We're not the least bit formal and we're really quite more rustic or Victorian cottage garden style in Hopalong Hollow. And one way that you achieve that, especially if you're doing a rustic garden, is by sticking with a couple of different elements in your garden. You don't want to use too many elements, but you want to use elements that go together. For example, we use a lot of these cedar logs because we just happen to have them. And you will see these all throughout the property. You will see a lot of stone throughout the property, and you will see a lot of rustic wood, such as the wattle fence, the pergola, and the teepees, and a lot of old brick. And these are things that just tie this garden together in sort of a theme. And the theme here is Hopalong Hollow, rusticity, a very old fashioned look. I really like this garden because it's on so many different levels and it has so many pieces of interest just in it. I love the way that you can use stone in so many different ways and a great way is to just guide the path. It meanders here and there. It twists and turns. Everything is rather unexpected because the shapes of the gardens is very odd. But we just followed the lay of the land in order to make these gardens. And it's not something that you can do overnight because a lot of it is improvisation when you're putting together a garden and things change and sometimes it takes years to get the garden the way you want it and that's just what part of it is. It, you, your garden just grows with you and evolves. It's uh, really rather interesting. If you watched the last video you may remember that I sprinkled um, quite a bit of seed and if you get down very very closely that was about 10 or 11 days ago and if you go very carefully, you can see that a lot of the flower seed is sprouting. Of course, we also have these persistent violets coming up. But as I've mentioned before, I don't mind the violets. They make a nice, pretty ground cover. And they just basically don't interfere with the other plants. 
This plant here was already growing. It's just coming up from the roots. It's called loose neck goose. I'm sorry, goose neck loose stripe. And it's really, really beautiful. So welcome to our first springtime tea in Hopalong Hollow. It's a gorgeous Easter morning. It's a wonderful day for so very many reasons. And today's tea is a very simple and light tea. We're having lemon curd cookies and we're having tea sandwiches and we're having a wonderful Harney and Sons Royal Wedding Tea. 
nice to be able to sit under this pergola and take tea. Let me first introduce you to this beautiful dishware. And please forgive my French. Le Fruit de Jardin. And this is from Royal Botanical Gardens, Q. The Royal Botanical Garden Q was founded in 1759 and covers 300 acres. It includes four grade one listed buildings and 36 grade two listed structure. It is a world leader in plant science and conservation and a major visitor attraction in England, which I would absolutely love to go there one day. But in the meantime, I'm simply enjoying their dinnerware in fact, I drink my coffee out of this cup almost every day. And it's beautiful, fine china with gorgeous graphics, as you can see. So we've got the cups, the saucers, and the dessert plates. And that's really all we need today because we've got a very simple tea. Today's wonderful tea is Harney and Sons Royal Wedding Tea. White tea with pink rosebuds. This comes in a sachet. And as you can see, there are all sorts of interesting little things in that sachet. So this tea contains rose petals, corn flowers, also known as bachelor buttons, marigold petals, vanilla, coconut, and white tea. And this is one of my favorite Harney and Sons tea. It's really especially nice because it's kind of a light tea, very flavorful, has all sorts of flavors in it besides the tea because really you can, you can really taste a lot of those things. And it's lovely for a spring morning, a cool spring morning because it is a little bit nippy out here today. Hence, I'm wearing my gloves again. I love the idea that this tea has corn flowers in it because all the flowers on our table today are the same color as corn flowers, which aren't blooming yet. But look at our beautiful flowers that are, are growing right now as we speak in the garden. So we have Spanish and, or English bluebells, chives, the wisteria, and back here is absolutely wonderful lilac bushes starting to bloom. And then these tiny little purples, actually good sized purples, are periwinkle. Today, from a silver plate embossed teapot. This is um, probably from the early 1900s. I chose it because the embossed cherries along the neck here go with the dishes. If you're interested in antique teapots, I have an entire video on nothing but antique teapots. Actually, pewter, enamelware, and Britannia-ware teapots. If you're interested in collecting them, I'll tell you a lot about them in one of my videos. Dainty tea sandwiches are pretty traditional to have with the tea, and they're the simplest thing in the world to make, obviously. The main thing is you want to cut off the crusts. And the reason for that, I don't really know, except for the fact that it does give you a very dainty sandwich and it makes it kind of uniform so that you can cut it into nice little triangles and oblong shapes. So just choose the filling that you like. And I chose a few things here that I like. And that would be traditional chicken salad with cranberries, walnuts, and celery, and a little piece of spinach. This is a sandwich spread I grew up on. It's egg and olive. It's simply an egg salad with olives in it and then tied with a little chive. My mother never tied it with the chive and she didn't cut the crusts off. <laughs> but we grew up on egg and olive sandwiches and I wonder if anybody else did because I've never met anyone else who ate egg and olive sandwiches. So if you did, let me know. And if you know the history behind them, I would certainly be interested. And then to go with a little more tradition, I made some cream cheese, cucumber, and smoked salmon sandwiches as well. I couldn't get myself to do the traditional uh, buttered bread with the really thinly sliced cucumbers because I just don't like them. But I think these are pretty good sandwiches. They're pretty easy. And I think they're great for a nice little snack.
probably a nice little afternoon tea. Love lemon. Do you like lemon meringue pie or key lime pie? Then you must make this lemon curd. Not since I made the clotted cream have I cooked something as delicious as this. This is so rich and buttery and lemony. It's just unbelievable. And I debated on whether to put these in tarts or use these on the smash cookies. But they are so good on these cookies. They just go so beautifully together. Now, if you do make this, make both of these a day in advance. You don't want to use the cookies straight out of the oven. You want them to get a little bit harder which they will do if they sit overnight. And then you refrigerate the lemon curd, and then you'll apply it when you're ready to eat the cookies. And my goodness, you're gonna love these. And that little extra taste of the raspberry on top makes it even better. So, <laughs> this is really gonna be a yummy, yummy treat. And how perfect to be sitting in the garden that we have worked so hard on over the last couple months, even though it's not quite to the point where it will be in a couple more weeks. Oh my goodness, so far so good. So let's enjoy our tea. Uh, just on a little side note here, people ask me many times, I've had comments and even emails asking me why do I wear gloves all the time? And the answer is very simple. I have really cold hands, number one. Number two, my hands bruise so easily that I, if I so much as tap them sometimes, I get a big red bruise on my hands, which is not very pretty. And number three, for many years, I worked in the garden without gloves. I did crafts without gloves, and it pretty much destroyed my hands. And in other words, I don't have beautiful hands like some people do. You don't really want to see them. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> and no offense taken. Also, one more thing. I would love for you to try this cookie and eat it so slowly because this is a luxurious cookie. And when you drink it with this marvelous tea, and I highly re recommend it, I don't think I've steered you wrong yet on the teas. This is one I highly recommend. It's light, it's flavorful, and it's so special because it has those pink rosebuds in it. And you will love this tea. So, from Hopalong Hollow, a beautiful spring day to you. And we'll see you next time. And I believe in our next video, we're going to begin a series about antique flowers and how to grow them. So, this is Jerry saying goodbye for the day and see you next time. Bye.